welcome everybody to what is our first, our inaugural DLD, that's Development Leadership Dialogue Annual Lecture. Um, we're going to be doing these every year, not necessarily the same date, but, but, but once a year, we will be able to bring um, very distinguished speakers and discussants uh, to, to introduce a, a conversation to, to you all. Um, before I introduce our, our main speaker and uh, for today and our discussants, I'm just, for those of you, in case you don't know, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about our institute, about DLD, which is made possible, I'd like to note, by uh, the funding from the Hyundai Motor Group in South Korea. So, as you're all very aware, we live in a world characterized by dramatic changes, by heightened uncertainties, many of them related to climate change above all, but also to the so-called fourth industrial revolution, to shifts in global order, to the various intersecting problems sometimes described as a polycrisis. Uh, and in that context, there's an ever greater need to overcome the lack of mutual understanding, the lack of dialogue, uh, and the siloization, as we call it, uh, across disciplines and across sectors, particularly in the, the development world. And what our Institute DLD seeks to do is to try and help overcome that mutual misunderstanding, that lack of constructive dialogue, by bringing people and perspectives together who are not always in the same room having a, a polite, constructive um, dialogue around strategic development uh, concerns. So we couldn't think of a better person for our first DLD annual lecture to invite um, to speak to us than Professor Yuan Yuan Ang. Um, she is a, a very esteemed multidisciplinary uh, social scientist who also engages with the literature in, in the maths of fractals and natural science and so on and so forth. And we'll be hearing more about that today. Um, Professor Ang is the Alfred Chandler Chair Professor of Political Economy at Johns Hopkins University in the USA. She's a scholar particularly of development and of innovation with a particularly to date, a, a focus on, on, on China's experience. And her work has been recognized both for its intellectual and its wider public impact. So she's the, the author of two very acclaimed books, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap uh, and China's Gilded Age. Both of them have been featured in, in The Economist and described as game-changing. She's I'm going to list a range of awards. She's, she's the inaugural recipient of the Theda Scotch Pole Prize for Impactful Contributions to the Study of Comparative Politics, awarded by the American Political Science Association. Uh, she has book awards across most, multiple social sciences, the Peter Katzenstein Prize, the Viviana Zelitzer Prize, the Douglas North Award. I'm really envious of the next one, the Alice Amsden Award in socioeconomics and the Barrington Moore Prize. Um, there's a, a UK platform for uh, public servants called Apolitical, and it named her amongst the world's most, 100 most influential academics in government. The premier US outlet on, on foreign policy, foreign affairs, named Yuan uh, and her writing amongst the best of books and the best of print. She's advised and worked with multilateral organizations, UN, UNDP, national development agencies on this issue of adaptive governance and on anti-corruption and China's role in global development. Professor Ang has been profiled in American, Chinese, Korean, Indonesian, and European outlets, including podcast interviews at Free Economics Radio and the Ezra Klein Show. So we're really looking forward to her talk, but we have bonus material. We have two superb, distinguished discussants, one of whom is Dr. Jean Bolton, who is currently a visiting senior research fellow at the Department of Social and Policy Studies at the University of Bath. She's also a visiting fellow at Cranfield University. Uh, 
she's an ex-theoretical physicist, which you will come to realize is very important in tonight's discussion about complexity. And she's, amongst other things, uh, worked over a long period of time with, with Oxfam. She's the lead author of one book, call it, which is very um, influential in this field, called Embracing Complexity. She's also the author of a book, a new book coming out in September, called The Tao of Complexity. So that's one to look forward to. Uh, we were going to be joined by our friend from the LSC, uh, Professor James Putzel, but due to an emergency, he's unable to be with us. But that just allows us to, to bring my co-director, Jonathan DeJohn, up as the second discussant um, who, who, is, uh, who teaches with me in the Department of Development Studies here at SOAS. So, um, Yuan Yuan Ang is going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, I, I think, and then our discussants for 10 and five minutes, respectively. And then we will open up a, a bit of a Q&A and then our other co-director, Hajun Chang, will bring proceedings to a close. And you are most welcome to join us for a reception afterwards. I'm going to stop rabbiting on and hand straight over to you, Anne. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction and to everyone for coming today. It is an incredible honor to speak at the Development Leadership Dialogue DLD lecture series. Let me first congratulate DLD on your launch. I'm really excited about the fresh ideas and silo-busting collaborations that your institute will be offering in the years to come. Oh, to be introduced um, and to be invited by uh, Professor Ha Jun Chang, who co-directs uh, DLD gives me special joy uh, and privilege. I'm going to begin with his book today. More than a decade ago, I read Hajun's classic, Kicking Away the Leather, and I was captivated by his opening question. How did the rich nations really become rich? The word really underscored implies that there is a certain reality about Western development versus a glorified misrepresentation of it in standard accounts. And that inspired me to write my first book, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap, on how China actually developed, as opposed to how it should develop, according to conventional prescriptions. As economists privately joke, the Chinese economy works in practice. It just doesn't work in theory. But my talk today is not going to be about China. I'd like to bring your attention to a much broader and deeper form of misrepresentation that cuts across the practice and study of development. That is, political economists routinely treat living, complex, adaptive social systems as machine-like objects. This norm is explicitly identified by Professors Bonaggi and Duflo at MIT, co-winners of the Nobel Prize in 2019 for their pioneering work in randomized controlled experiments. In their words, Economists tend to think in machine mode. They want to find the button that will get the machine started. Indeed, they argue that it is not enough to look for the right button. They urge economists to be like plumbers and step into the machine, install the machine in the real world, and then tinker as needed. Now, know that this is not a mere metaphor, but it reflects a fundamental assumption about the nature of social systems, from which methods, research agendas, and public policies are derived. This is what Thomas Kuhn calls a paradigm. When the scientist can take a paradigm for granted, Kuhn notes, he need no longer attempts to build new fields anew, starting from first principles 
and justifying the use of each concept introduced. The conventional paradigm in political economy takes for granted that social systems are like machines. That is why we are rarely aware of this assumption, and we don't think there's anything wrong with it. Now, international development is full of examples of mechanical thinking and its practical extensions. One example, economists are constantly searching for a single, quote-unquote, primary cause or a model that can be replicated around the world to produce an identical outcome. And this logic is equivalent to a factory's production mold. Planners also like to take an inherently interconnected and dynamic problem, like reducing global poverty, and break it down into numerous tiny static bits. As Albert Hirschman insightfully observes, development projects are privileged particles of the development process. Then each particle is further dissected into finer particles using a modern bureaucratic contraption known as log frames, a linear matrix of inputs and outputs, which, if you look close enough, looks like a factory's conveyor belt. Now, visually expressed, the mechanical logic is sort of like taking fish out of a pond and sticking them on a board. And you might feel that something is odd and missing in this picture because it strips away what is essential to the reality, which is the interaction among the moving parts. So why do we habitually think in machine mode? As Robert Axelrod and Michael Cohen remind us, most people in industrial nations have worked with machines and have been exposed to the discipline of the factory or office. This has a powerful influence on our way of thinking about politics and society. But here is the problem. Are political economies really like machines? In fact, social systems and processes, whether it is governments, economies, even tiny villages, development, innovation, conflict, pandemic responses, they bear very little resemblance to machines. Now let's pause for a moment and consider the defining attributes of a machine, like a toaster. A toaster is made up of separate components that do not adapt to one another or the environment. To assemble a toaster, you follow the instruction manual and put the parts in order, as you would see in a development log frame. When dealing with machines, processes are linear and outcomes can be precisely predicted and controlled. Press a button and warm bread pops up. When a toaster breaks down, all you need to do is tinker with or replace the part that's broken. So think about the attributes that I have just described. Do politics, governments, and markets match this list of attributes? And clearly they do not. Instead, political economies are systems rather than machines. They're more like trees than toasters. A system is made up of many interconnected elements that adapt to one another and the environment. The relationships among the parts are just as, if not more important than the individual components. And this is a term that organizations refer to as climate. When dealing with systems, processes are not linear and any single intervention can produce unintended outcomes. There isn't a magic button to press. Yet although humans cannot precisely control systems, understanding how trees truly function can help us harness the resources of nature sustainably. So machines are complicated, whereas systems are complex. The words complex and complicated are conflated 
in both popular and social scientific language. In fact, they are two qualitatively distinct categories: studying and managing social systems as if they're machines. Is not actually simplifying; it is distorting, and this is exactly what we see in industrial farming. As the political anthropologist James Scott reminds us, that practice has resulted in forest death, in which entire forests die off because an exceptionally complex process involving soy building, nutrient takeup, and symbiotic relations were disrupted. With serious consequences, and these consequences, he said, can be traced to the radical simplification of the forest. In his famous book *Seeing Like a State*, he warns of similar disasters in top-down schemes of development and modernization. So now is the big question: What's the alternative? I'm not the first to critique the conventional mechanical paradigm. I'm not the first to call for embracing complexity and systems thinking. There's a lot of writing out there. Embracing is a very good and essential first step to change, but I'm going to stress that that is not enough. The alternative to mechanical thinking is not concluding with warm, fuzzy messages like embrace systems, promote innovation. Or be humble, because obviously we should. It is not about resigning to life being messy, and it is not anything goes. It is definitely not the extreme opposite of rejecting empirical study and theory. The alternative is taking the hard steps of recognizing and not assuming away the essential qualities of complex adaptive social systems. Studying them using social scientific procedures, observe, record, trace, measure, validate, and theorizing these essential qualities. And finally, the test of these hot steps is whether it generates fresh conclusions about important social questions like development. If adopting a new paradigm does not change your conclusions, then you don't need to have a new. Paradigm. So all of this is what I'm going to call adaptive political economy. For a short essay, you can find this article in、um, World Politics, which is open access.、Um, when I say adaptive political economy, I'm not only calling for a new paradigm, a new way of thinking, but I'm also calling for a new way of action. New research programs that will generate new findings that inform public policies. There are several examples from my own work, and let me briefly discuss one. Political economists have long struggled with a chicken and egg problem: which comes first in development, growth, or good institutions? And in the temple of political economy. Authoritative economists and political scientists have occupied three different pedestals on this question. One school, known as modernization theory, asserts that economic growth precedes and will drive political and institutional development, specifically democracy. But it cannot explain how an economy takes off in the first place. For Jeffrey Sachs, the answer was to inject massive foreign aid with comprehensive, elite-designed programs. In reality, however, his grand scheme backfired. Plans made in New York City were constantly sunk by unexpected problems on the ground. Foreign aid often fails for the same reason that communist regimes failed. They both rely on top-down central planning. A second school, institutional economics, argues the reverse: good modern institutions are necessary for economic prosperity. And the World Bank here provides a definition of good governance/slash institutions. 
which are predictable, open, and enlightened policy making, a bureaucracy imbued with a professional ethos, an executive arm of government accountable for its action, a strong civil society participating in public affairs, and all behaving under the rule of law. I heard a few giggles. I'm glad you did because it hardly describes the first world today. But this school of thought, even less, cannot explain how a poor society that lacks capacity can quickly establish the ideal institutions needed for growth. In reality, decades of best practice reforms led by international institutions to make poor countries skip straight to Weber have proven disappointing and even backfired. As Lang Pritchett and Michael Wilcock lament, simply mimicking the organizational forms of a particular Denmark has in fact been a root cause of the deep problems encountered by developing countries. Then we get to a third school, path dependence. It cleverly gets around the chicken and egg problem by underscoring the self-reinforcing effects of history. It argues that colonies inhabited by European migrants who brought inclusive, non-extractive institutions with them thrived, while colonies in Latin America and Africa inherited corrupt institutions and thus stayed poor. As the eminent economists Deron Asimoglu and Jim Robinson conclude in Why Nations Fail, once society gets organized in a certain way, this tends to persist. The persistence and the forces that created it also explain why it is so difficult to remove world inequality and to make poor countries prosperous. I think most of you would agree with them. But if their conclusion is correct, we should give up on doing development because the past has already determined the present. As Stephen de Korn at Oxford comments, their advice may be summarized as get yourself a good history rather than the bad one you have suffered. All right, so we have reviewed three schools of thought each led by towering giants, but they all failed to find a way out of the chicken and egg problem of development. And I think we should take a few moments to ask ourselves, why are they stuck? And the reason is because they ignored the fact that development is by nature a co-evolutionary or endogenous process meaning the economy and institutions mutually adapt over a sequence of multiple steps. That is an essential quality of development. They ignored this reality and forced it to fit within the convention of linear static models, more suited for simple machines than for systems. In other words, they oversimplified. So I'd like to suggest to you a different way of studying development, and I'm going to draw on examples from my own work. In How China Escaped the Poverty Trap, I take endogeneity, meaning co-evolution or mutual change between the economy and institutions, as my starting point, as a natural process to be understood rather than purged from analysis. To this end, I developed a qualitative method for tracing and modeling this pattern. First, building on organizational scholar Merman, I introduce a template for mapping co-evolution in any two given domains. And in this figure, you see the example of a co-evolution process between the economy and bureaucracy. Then, I collected hundreds of oral histories with bureaucrats and entrepreneurs across China to record changes in the local economy, bureaucratic goals and incentives, diverse forms of property rights, 
development strategies, industrial policies, and so on. From the 1980s to the 2000s in coastal and interior parts of China. All of this data collection generated thousands of pages of transcripts. And with that data, I generated many detailed coevolution maps with an example shown here, which you can find throughout my book. Note that this is all painstaking data collection and analysis. As I said before, doing adaptive political economy is not resigning to life being messy or anything goes. It is about doing research, but in a different way, with different aims, with a very clear starting point that causation is nonlinear and the change agents are the one on the ground rather than at the top. And I also should stress that while the example I've shown here is qualitative and historical, adaptive political economy is not limited to qualitative methods. In one of my more recent projects, which is also an outgrowth of my first book, I'm applying natural language processing and computational statistics. So methods by itself is not a problem. Quantitative methods, it's not a problem. The issue is only when we apply certain methods to answer questions based on unrealistic assumptions about how social systems work. Now back to this book, I was pretty sure that skeptics were going to say that this framework only applies to the exotic country of China. So I repeated the same analysis across a wide range of cases that appear to have very little to do with one another. The emergence and dissolution of regional trade in late medieval Europe, the evolution of public finance in 19th century America, and the unlikely rise of the film industry Nollywood in post-1990s Nigeria. And I find that while their context and details vary drastically, all of these cases shed certain commonalities in their process, in the co-evolutionary sequence of development. And this I distill into three essential steps. Step one is to harness normatively weak institutions to build new markets. Step two, when markets emerge, that stimulates and enables the creation of strong slash modern institutions. Step three, the establishment of strong modern institutions serve to preserve markets. I'm gonna take a step back and highlight two important fresh conclusions from this alternative model of development. First, the institutions, methods, or capacities for building new markets look and function differently from the strong ones that later evolved to sustain mature markets. And think about this as the distinction between a startup and a Fortune 500 company. The strategies that you need to run a Fortune 500 company may be disastrous for a startup and vice versa. Okay. Indeed, market building institutions often look wrong to first world technocrats. That is why I stress in step one that such institutions are only normatively weak. That is weak from the first world perspective. What do conventional models miss? They incorrectly assume that growth-promoting institutions come in one universal package, like those found in idealized Western liberal economies. They fail to distinguish among stages of development, particularly the different needs, constraints, and resources at early and advanced stages of development, and the different solutions that could fit them. And without acknowledging so, they judge what is best and what is ideal from the standards of the modern and the Western. Second, expressed simply, 
the first step of development is using what you have, not what you want. The poor cannot innovate with what they do not have, wealth and modern capacity. They must necessarily creatively repurpose what they do have, practices, resources, local knowledge that the rich may dismiss as backward to kickstart change. A keyword here is repurpose, meaning existing materials do not perform miracles by themselves. For example, in China, township and village governments had long been in place. And when market reformists prevailed over Maoists, they repurposed these pre-existing units to create collective property rights and surrogate entrepreneurs. Another example, in Nigeria, filmmakers learned to work with informal distributors and pirates to sell their films. A second keyword here is innovative actors. Experts know that innovation is integral to development, but we tend to think of innovation as the exclusive purview of the educated or the rich. What my model emphasizes is that all development begins with modest forms of innovation among non-elites, the poor, or grassroots actors. And this reality is ignored by conventional models privileging foreign aid, first world best practices, and fortunate colonial legacies. In sum, this example demonstrates a principle that I call simple, but not any simpler. I've reduced an immense diversity of moving parts, what may appear to be a mess, into its most essential form, development as a process of three co-evolutionary steps. Now, this exercise is not mere storytelling. Notice that it reaches new conclusions with theoretical implications about how development begins and evolves, practical implications about what kinds of solutions to promote, and moral implications about which actors we should empower and which ones we have been disempowering in practice. If I simplify it any further and remove one step, it becomes over-reductionist because doing so erases the distinction between market building and market preserving stages of development and the different solutions that fit each stage. I could add two more steps. I could add 27 more steps if I wanted to, but that is not the simplest form of model. Now, let me further elaborate on the concept of simple, but not any simpler using the most intuitive example. Now, in reality, we know there is an infinite variety of humans on earth. Um, we all look very different, tall and short, stocky and skinny, different hair. Um, and you can go on and on describing this immense diversity. Some people are resistant to the notion of modeling or theory. They think it sounds pedantic. But in fact, we've been modeling all the time in order to simplify and make sense of the world around us. And we've learned it from the time we are kids, introducing the stick figure. The stick figure is a model. It is the simplest representation of reality that all of us at some point have participated in. Now, when you see a stick figure, you know it's a human, even though it's very simple, because it captures all of the essential qualities of a human a head, torso, limbs, and a nice smile. This is the most basic model, and it cannot be reduced any further. If you say remove the head of the stick figure, it over-reduces and becomes unrecognizable, even a bit silly. It no longer represents a human because an essential feature has been removed. Likewise, in political economy, when we study complex social systems and processes, we cannot remove their essential qualities. So in the case of development, we cannot deny that development is a nonlinear, endogenous process with mutually adaptive parts 
and different stages have distinct dynamics. Assuming those qualities away, as you see in the conventional models, is oversimplistic. It is not parsimonious. In both of my books, I have applied the principle of simple but not any simpler to various social contexts. I've introduced the one uh, in, on development. Now, in reality, development has many moving parts and infinitely many details across contexts. You can describe these differences until you drop to the floor with exhaustion and not see a pattern. We do not want that because the purpose of science is to help us see patterns. But we do not want to go to the other extreme of oversimplification, of theorizing development as a linear process with no distinction across stages. What my study offers is the middle path, recognizing two essential qualities. A, development is a co-evolutionary process, and B, market building is not the same as market preserving, goes a long way toward enriching our knowledge of how development actually happens. In my second book, I turned to corruption. Again, in reality, corruption comes in endlessly different forms, varying across countries, cultures, and sectors. You can identify 20 categories or 421 categories if you wanted to. But that wouldn't be very helpful if you had that many forms and categories. But the other opposite is not helpful either because it's too simplistic. Corruption is conventionally conceptualized and measured as a one-dimensional problem, ranging from zero to 100. It does not distinguish between varieties and types. So again, I offer a middle path conceptualizing corruption and measuring it in four distinct categories, petty theft, grand theft, speed money, and access money. So if you're interested, you can find a new prototype of a metric of corruption, which I call the Unbundled Corruption Index, in my second book, China's Gilded Age. What this middle path shows you is that it shifts our attention from the mere aggregate quantity of corruption to the quality of corruption. In reality, the difference between poor and rich countries, it shows, isn't always that rich countries have less or no corruption, but rather that their corruption is of a different quality, more likely to be legalized, sophisticated, and ambiguously unethical. So to recap, the alternative to a mechanical paradigm is not concluding with things like promote innovation or be humble, because obviously we should. It is not resigning to life being messy. It is not anything goes. It is not the extreme opposite of rejecting empirical study and theory. Adaptive political economy is about doing science. It is about doing social science, but with a focus on recognizing and not assuming away the essential qualities of complex social systems. The analogy that I use in my World Politics article is that we need the equivalent of fractals in political economy. Fractals is the geometry of rough shapes. And there's a really interesting story behind this. Classical math in the 20th century and earlier studied only straight lines and perfect geometric shapes, like circles, squares, cones, triangles. And it regarded the rough shapes in nature, such as clouds, trees, waves, mountains, as beyond the grasp of scientific inquiry. These kinds of shapes were described as formless, amorphous, even pathological. The academic establishment regarded the existence of rough shapes as a problem because it didn't fit their existing models. Then Benoit Mendelbro came along. At the time, he was a programmer at IBM, 
And he argued that roughness was in fact not senseless and chaotic, but surprisingly ordered. Applying mathematical procedures and visual techniques, he showed that this order can be theorized and demonstrated. Indeed, the logic of rough shapes is so mathematically precise that it can be replicated in computer programs to create extremely realistic graphics. He did not shrug and conclude with, be humble, our existing math is inadequate, but what to do? For decades, however, Mandelbrot was rejected and scorned by the establishment. At the age of 75, he was the oldest professor to receive tenure at Yale University. That same year, Cambridge University offered him a professorship as well. But they had to withdraw it because they learned that he was 10 years beyond the retirement age. So thanks to his persistence today, his research on fractals is transforming fields as diverse as biology, chemistry, engineering, medicine, physics, and visual arts. Imagine the potential if we do this in political economy. Thank you. Um, I've got some, um, there's lots of things I could talk for another 45 minutes easily, but um, I will restrain myself. So I wanted to make um, a few points. I'm I'm uh, originally a theoretical physicist, so I'm, I'm not um, unused to mathematics and I've moved by various random walks into um, management, social science, um, international development. And um, um, despite um, you only not, not liking the title, I've, I've written a book called Embracing Complexity, and uh, um, it's um, it's a kind of interesting idea. I've been interested in complexity for um, for an awfully long time. Um, I wanted to make um, four different points in, in my in this short time. The first one is is I'm very much in agreement um, with the the central. Um, process being a co-evolutionary process, that co-evolution, the idea that many things come together, um, interact, weave together, and something comes out of that, is a central idea that really um, is, is seen by, by many cosmologists these days as being the central feature of the universe as a whole, um, not just of, of social um, or environmental systems. So the idea that, that things interweave, interact in a reflexive way, um, something happens, then something else happens. I see that as a path-dependent process, so I'm not allergic to path dependency. I see that as a central idea um, to um, complexity thinking. And it's kind of interesting um, in terms of paradigm shifts that um, Thorsten Veblen in 1898 wrote an absolutely wonderful paper called Why Isn't Economics an Evolutionary Science?, and um, and he was kind of being scathing about how how could possibly economists think about machines and and balance and all these things. So the the paradigm um, uh, has been around for an awfully long time in economics, and I think it's a very interesting question of of why why do we never pick it up? And one one reason is to do with the fact we like to think in machines. But the reason why we want to think about um, machines is because it gives the people at the top lots of power. And there's a lot of, of issues around the way power is held that, that means that we don't like this idea of, of an emerging, co-evolving um, society. So I'm completely um, with you on, on the co-evolutionary point. Um, I think I'd like to broaden it, and I think that's important for international development, that it's not just about politics and economics, whatever they are. It's about the environment. It's about climate change. Well, the biggest thing that happened to the economy was the pandemic. Um, so in terms of not over, not simplifying too early, and I like that phrase, um, there's, a, there's another one that says um, we should look at simplicity on the other side of complexity. So if we're looking at social and um, situations, it's, it's very good to, to broaden and think about the co-evolving processes um, that may not just be political and economic, but may have many other things going on. Um, and, and in terms of, of kind of narrowing down. So um, I, I wanted to make that point. 
Um, the second point um, I wanted to make was uh, about uh, complexity as an ontology. So I think, as Yuan Yuan is saying, the, the world is complex whether we like it or not. But that doesn't just mean, well, it's all kind of messy and horrible and we better do something to shape it up, as, as she is saying too. Um, the world is patterned. Um, I much prefer to use the word patterns rather than systems because systems can sound like something with edges. Um, it can sound like it, it could be a reification of things. But there's definitely the world is patterned. And in our science of complexity, we both have to look at the patterning of the world, but also the way things change. We're, we're always looking out for those emergent processes. Um, and so there's something here that goes beyond mathematical. Um, the, the, the work of, of, of fractals is, is, was very interesting as a piece of, of mathematics, but it's not the same as saying that the complex emerging social and environmental world can be captured by mathematics. Um, I'm, I'm a mathematician, really, but um, the, there's something about what emerges that's qualitative, tiny, cannot be captured um, by those um, and, until things settle down into patterns. So there's something a, a, a important um, uh, there that goes that is patterning. It's dynamic. There are things that are emerging. Um, and we can't always um, capture those things in mathematical terms. And I'm, I'm unfortunately, I have a particular kind of um, allergy to fractals um, in the in the sense of it. It was a kind of early, um, a very the very simplest of complex models in the 1980s developed uh, fractals. But it has moved on into understanding things in a more complex way. But I think the point um, that's underlying talking about fractals, um, I agree with. The third point I want to make is, is about um, intervention. And what I really um, like uh, about uh, Yuan Yang's work is, is that she has used um, a, a way of understanding what does happen, of actually looking at things rather than theorising in a variety of ways. And, um, and I agree. I think, um, I, I think if, in my words, not yours, I think your three-step process is a path-dependent process. Um, and um, it, the, to, in my mind, there's nothing wrong with path dependency. It's what, what goes wrong is when people think that history entirely determines the future. I don't think we can get away from the fact that history shapes but not determines the future. There are many things that come together to create what's going to happen in the future. Um, what, what I like um, and, and is something I emphasise in my own writing is that sometimes people feel with complexity is that it, it, they use it as a way to justify a laissez-faire approach to economics. Um, the, the idea that kind of anything goes and somehow or other there will be some sort of natural law which makes things balance up and, and, and somehow it will be, be okay in the end. And as, as Stiglitz, for example, says, there's no such thing as an invisible hand. It doesn't kind of work that way. So I think what you've done in looking at China is, is understood the role of the state, the role of intervention. And, and in international development, you know, there's a, there's a variety of ways. You're trying, we're trying to intervene well um, in situations. So there's nothing wrong in looking at, through the lens of complexity with the idea that, that, that you want to be effective in your, in your intervention. And I think the idea um, that I've understood in, in your writing about uh, uh, that what's happened in China, which is about being contextual, um, being weak, weak, but not too weak, you know, being able to 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 nudge and shape, help to um, adapt what's there is something that there's a lot to learn. And it's certainly something I would very much uh, agree with. And I'm not of the view that complex systems just you leave them to themselves and they all kind of naturally balance up. And of course, we even in nature, you know, sometimes things adapt, sometimes things collapse, sometimes things run away, um, sometimes power in a variety of ways, even in that, the natural world, gets locked in. So I'm slightly wary. It's not a term I would uh, tend to use that, that, that complex systems necessarily adapt. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But the question for us as, as interveners is how do we intervene in a way that, that is adaptive, that can actually, um, and what do we mean by that? And I think, as you said, in some of your writing, it's quite a complex word in itself. Like, what does what does it mean? What does adaptive mean? Um, and I, I, I want to suggest that it can mean partly um, we want to adapt towards a goal. 
And I want to come back to this idea of goal. And there's obviously a goal in China. There was a goal of growth, a goal, a goal of, of moving people out of poverty. So are we, that's one way to understand adapting. Are we adapting towards something? So we know how to nudge something, um, or we we are we are looking to go over there. We have a, an idea of, of where we're going. There's another way of, of understanding adapting, which is adapting to the particularities of context. So there's something about if we're going to be if we're going to successfully intervene, do we understand here as opposed to there? What are the qualities? What are the patternings of qualities? What are the opportunities that this situation? What's its history here that in, that, that shapes but does not determine? How do, how do we understand that? So there's something about contextually adapting that's important. And the third thing I think is is that we want to sometimes be able to adapt to the emerging future. And, and how do we do that? How do we notice what's emerging? And how do we respond to the sometimes the tiny details of, of, of what's about to, to happen? So I think it's an interesting word. And I think there is definitely a tradition in a more restrictive sort of complexity thinking, which talks about complex adaptive systems. But there's a more general way. Edgar Moran is very, is very good on this, where we, we just need to be more open to the, the fact that in open situations in the complex um, social world and environmental world are, are definitely open, um, then we can't capture it in a kind of mathematical sense. We can understand, we have a paradox between understanding the current patternings of relationships, partly shaped by history, and also noticing those things which are starting to, to emerge and, and um, are, are salient too. So the final point I wanted to, to make, and it's really a kind of question for all of us, um, I, and, and something I, um, as, as Chris was saying, I've just been finalising um, a new book myself, and, um, and I, I end up with some of the kind of big global challenges for us. And one of the big things that I'm really interested in, and I'm not an economist, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a physicist, is um, why do we keep assuming that we can keep growing? Why do, why do economists never talk about the limits to growth? We've, we've developed a, an economic uh, process that's predicated on growth, but it's not like science. It's not like it has to be that way. There are other ways of doing things. You know, we can uh, we can change the nature of tax. We can change the nature of, of, of all sorts of things. We can change the, the role of the state. So we can't, in my um, in my little physics mind, we can't grow forever. There, there, are, there are limits to growth created by um, the, the, the finite amount of resources. But what I find really interesting is why do we not talk more about inequality? That, that inequality is growing at a huge rate um, and, and, and in China, that China is, is, has greater inequality than, than the US. If, if we could deal with inequality, we wouldn't need so much stuff. We wouldn't need to be pushing for more stuff um, and, and growth. And it, it, it's where the role of the state, again, it's quite interesting I, um, to, to think about this, the role of intervention, the role of the state. What are we going to do as a society? What, what does global governance mean? How, how, what kind of methods do we, as both as individuals, as communities, um, and as larger institutions, what are we going to do about inequality? And it's kind of a question I'd, I'd like to kind of put on, on the map for us this evening a little bit. Um, what complexity theory tells you is with the path dependent approach, if you don't do anything about it and you are selfish, then the rich get richer and the powerful get more powerful. They get more locked in and unassailable and it gets harder to actually do something about it. And a, a lot of the political writers really look at that. And sometimes it feels like, you know, why do I, what happens to empires when they get too, too fat and happy and greedy? They collapse. You know, what are we? Can we do anything before we get to that stage around inequality? Resilient societies don't have this level of, of inequality. So I'd just like to, I'd, I'd be interested to, to ask you um, a little bit about, about this balance between uh, growth and inequality. So anyway, that's enough from me. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Jean. Um, I have a shorter set of comments. Uh, I have sort of five very brief points. I think um, 
Well, I think the first one that I think is really important about UNUN's work is is really part of this Albert Hirschman tradition that we need to focus on development as a process of adaptation of solving problems and development projects observed, which I still think is probably the most creative book written on the subject. And as opposed to thinking about blueprints and policy as the focus, we really need to focus on learning and adaptation. How does do, how do societies correct suboptimal situations, whatever they are? Um, I think that's one thing that's great that she's kind of extended and contributed to this tradition. I think the second one is really her work has helped us think about how we reassess lessons learned from other countries. What is success, as Hajin points out, what does it really look like? It, it, it obviously doesn't start with Western-looking institutions of good governance. It starts with something else. But her work points out something, not only that the, are these initial conditions not a pathology, they're a norm, but these situations can be the source of actually very effective mobiliza- uh, processes that mobilize and create markets. And so it's not only that we're rethinking lessons learned, but we're rethinking how they matter in different contexts. Um, just to, to bring this discussion to some particular development economics points and, and points of historical political economy, I think one of them is that um, innovation, adaptation, experimentation costs a lot of money. Um, I think Frederick Hayek pointed out something that, you know, the United States in a good in a year, and he was talking about the 1980s, has the luxury to throw five, seven hundred billion dollars a year down the drains in failed startups. And, you know, when we think of success stories um, of catch up, they're stories of societies that have mobilized an enormous amount of resources, either through forcing savings, creating public development banks, and China certainly, I mean, has a development bank that's about 10 times the size of the World Bank in loans per year, just to give a sense of that scale. So her brilliant um, discussion of directed improvisation has a massive resource mobilization story behind it that a lot of societies, one thing to the audience is, you know, I think that's a key challenge when we think about adaptation. We need to think about where the financing, how is it going to be created? Um, and related to that, I think, you know, I think like all great works, it asks us, it's heuristic values, it asks us to, to, to pose questions, new questions about things. Um, and one of the ones I have is, is why is ketchup regionally, um, why is there a regional pattern to the ketchup process? When we think of the 10 economies that have gone from less than, 30% of US GDP per capita to more than half, all of them are in three specific regions. It's Northeast Asia, it's Southern Europe, and it's Eastern Europe. They're all manufacturing stories, and they're all stories of massive development finance, both internally generated by political coalitions and external finance that were part of geopolitical projects and, and other reasons. So I think it's important to, um, I think her work lends us to think about why is there a pattern to catch up and why, and it's related to the fact that there are massive resources behind the ability to adapt. And, and, and so I think that's, and the last thing I'd like to sort of point out is that one of the, I think it was Douglas North who originally did this chart, but there were some other economists as well, Nichols Crafts perhaps. One of the things that distinguishes rich countries from poor ones when you look in the last 200 years is not how fast they grow. There's lots of regions in the world that have growth accelerations that last 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years, and then they experience either long, long and very deep depressions. That is, most poor countries are poor because they have very extended growth collapses. And so I think one of the things that your work might inspire is not only to ask why is it that some of these local arrangements can actually be efficient for creating and mobilizing markets, 
But to ask the question, what is it about the political economy of lots of societies that don't prevent them from getting into destructive growth collapses that undo 50 years of development? And I think that's a different type of adaptation that we're talking about, but I think it's something that would be fruitful um, to think about in further discussion. So I'm going to stop there and open up um, to the floor for any questions you might have. I can, uh, I can moderate the question and answer. So I think we'll take two questions at a time and then go like that so there's not too many to answer. So if there's a microphone in the audience that Angelica could... And Liz, you should raise your hand and they will come rushing. Naomi has her hand up. Thank you. Thank you, Yuan Yuan Ang. That was brilliant. I could have listened to you for hours, frankly. It was fantastic. Um, my question is, uh, in the adaptive political economy, is the political part a little bit silent? And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on who is doing the work of adapting, who is harnessing the weak institutions in your model, and why are they doing it? Take a second question this round. Right, just a question back to China's story, because you, well, your brilliant books were talking about a bit of, you know, the success story of China. But then the recent development of Chinese economy, you know, showing a little bit of reverse, you know, in terms of both economy and, you know, the institutions. I just, I'm just curious, how do you, you know, uh, adopt, you know, the recent changes in your framework? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I think we'll go two at a time. Or maybe not three at a time. Uh, Which part were you going to? How about we, we start here? We'll, we'll, we'll take uh, rounds of two. Round of two. Uh, uh, yeah. oh, you got it. Well, thank you so much. That was very that was a very thought provoking set of comments from Jean, from Jonathan, and I really appreciate that. And also great questions from the audience. Um, this is a reaction to 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 Jean and Jonathan. It's not a it's not an answer, but 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 one of the questions that I've been grappling with myself, which is very closely related to Jean's last question is that I think we are at a point where we should all ask ourselves, is modernization progress? You know, we really should all ask ourselves this simple question because it's not only a normative and moral question, it's actually also an empirical question because we've always taken for granted that modernization is all wonderful. It's all progress, right? And on that basis, on that assumption, we have other, we spin off other related concepts and questions and dependent variables like catch up, converge, right? That, that all assumes that you have this thing called modernize, right? That's the destination. That's the goal. So everyone catch up if you are not already there. And once you get there, you graduate, you're done, right? And it also generates Fundamental dependent variables, outcome variables in economics, which is success versus failure, right? Uh, winners versus losers, rich versus poor. So if you look at the titles of popular books like Why Nations Fail, right? We still talk in this language of like it's a football match. You win or you lose, you win or you lose, right? But if you, but if you really just, and any person can do that, you don't need to have a PhD, you just look at the world around us. I think we are we are faced with a deep irony because on the one hand, obviously modernization has brought us so many benefits. I mean, look at us here sitting in this nice lecture hall and it's not just the material benefits of life, it's also the social progress. Look at the diversity in this room, right? The fact that I, as a woman, as, as a minority, am speaking here, we've made social progress. But on the other hand, all of our material and social progress has come at tremendous costs that are at an existential level, right? And frankly, if all of the developing countries in the world became like the US at that level of consumption and production, we are just 
heading much faster towards complete destruction of everyone. That's a fact, right? And I think we do have to step back and be like, well, how do we end up at this point, right? Well, we've made progress on it in, in some very, very profound ways, but we are also seem to be just hastening our demise. And I think when we recognize that both as a moral question and also as an empirical one, it will help us to address a variety of questions, including the one you had asked about China. And that is why in my second book, I call it China's Gilded Age. It's not China's Golden Age, right? If the book is China's Golden Age, then I would be telling you success stories. But it's not also about China busting or collapsing, right? And what I love about the metaphor of the Gilded Age is that it simultaneously tells you that it's a good outcome, but it's also a bad outcome. And I think many people can relate to the famous term from Charles Dickens, the best of times and the worst of times, right? And I think as people who study development, we have to recognize the mixed outcomes, which is central to answering your question um, that um, if you look at my books in combination and my most recent essays, the successes and the risk and problems in China always come together. They actually come together logically, and it's not just random. So to give an example, corruption. Um, China in part succeeded in having rapid growth because the government encouraged supremely high-powered incentives. If you perform as a government official, you can be promoted, you can have bonuses, you can have many benefits that go along with your success. And precisely because of these high-powered incentives, you're also encouraging corruption. Right? So the good and the bad are both sides of the same coin. They go together logically. So we can understand many good and dark sides of China if we, if we accept the fact that many of the good and bad are actually two sides of the same coin. So, so my books actually have to be read together as, 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 as one package. And, and to Naomi's excellent question, who's doing the adapting? Well, that goes back to uh, the term that I use, not only to describe China, but also to describe any situation in which you, in which you have you are making an attempt to influence or guide the process of adaptation, which I call directed improvisation that Jonathan referred to. The role of the Chinese government when it did market um, opening is not that it continued with central planning, obviously, but it's also not less if, you know, just do whatever you want. It was a hybrid system in which the central government directed, but it set very clear goals, it set incentives, and penalties, and it is the local governments along with local entrepreneurs doing the adapting. So that's very important and also has wide relevance to pretty much any organization because it's never about any one of the two extremes. It's actually about the hybrid, right? The, the right answer is usually the middle path. I hope that point what came across clearly. And also directed improvisation while I focus on explaining it in the context of China. It's not unique to China. Um, I was just having a conversation with some students at uh, SOAS uh, yesterday, and I was telling them the example of how the American government promoted innovation. And contrary to the popular impression that there are no industrial policies in the United States. That's not true. The United States government did plenty of efforts to promote innovation. And their system is called coordinated decentralization, which if you think about it, sounds very much like the Chinese system, <laughs> right? It's just that, and the authors of the book, by the way, uh, the book is called The State of Innovation. It's a really excellent uh, book on American innovation. They said uh, there was this one line, I'm roughly paraphrasing, where they said, the reason most people don't know about American industrial policies isn't that it doesn't exist, but because it was against the ideology of neoliberalism. You know? And so, so that's why we don't hear about it. But if you look at these major economies, whether it's China or the United States, of course the government plays a big role in the economy, but it is not top-down planning, 
or the other extreme of doing nothing. It's always the in-between, and that in-between is intervening in the process of guiding adaptation. Okay, two more questions. Next two. Thanks so much. Fascinating uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, let me go back to the 60s. Herbert Simon writes a famous article on the architecture of complexity. And I use it with all my students, especially when, you know, you try to teach anything around production technology, co-evolving systems, and so on. We have a big tradition of evolutionary economics. You were mentioning Beblen, of course. And one of the problems that Simon had in that article was that if we try to understand complexity, we have problems with unit of analysis and problems with interdependencies and relevant interdependencies. So if I go back to your schematic, you know, the problem, I'm reading it through the lenses of Herbert Simon, would be how you define what are the relevant domains? Uh, how do you define what are the relevant uh, interdependencies that exist? And he introduced this idea of near uh, uh, decomposability trying to identify part of the subsystem and way to capture uh, uh, dynamics that might be heterogeneous, different across these different areas. So I'm curious about how you address this problem, because when people have applied, especially in uh, the field of evolutionary economics, understanding uh, industrial dynamics, em emerging dynamics of innovation, we always struggle because we realize a lot of the unit of analysis that we use when you do actually exactly what you're saying, try tracing innovation, finding how things move, what causational mechanism are in place, often these unit of, of analysis are wrong. So we realize that sectors don't mean anything, right? Or that the firm that you thought was qualified as a sector actually in a certain sector actually operates technologies and processes and way of operating that completely alien to that traditional classification. Um, we realize that you know we uh, uh, you know focus on certain type of relationship variable interdependencies, thinking that they are the right one, are the one that justify the causational mechanism, and in fact they are not necessarily uh, those. So I'm curious to understand really the analytics of the problem, right? Because if we say we want to unpack this complexity, what is this architecture, and how you in your work? Uh, because I think it's so important, especially. People were doing lots of work on the ground, trying to unpack a complex political economy settings, co-evolution. How do you identify these domains and how you identify this, uh, if you want, how do you decompose the system in a way uh, or the environment in a way that allows for uh, that uh, validation of the, of the outcome? One more question. Yeah. Hi, my question is, I mean, how do you fit in education in this? I work mainly with African countries where the spending on education is, is way too low. But then if you also look at the actual outcomes uh, from this spending, it's way lower than, for instance, Vietnam at present and also what you would have seen in, in China in the 70s and 80s when they were at a sort of similar level of, of development and educational spending. Thank you. Jean's just going to ask a quick add-on. Sorry, it wasn't a, it wasn't a quick add-on. It was partly an answer to your question, but I, you answer it first, or I, it's, yes, you answer it first, and I'll. I mean, oh. Well, thank you very much. First question. Um, um, uh, it gives me an opportunity to um, to to reiterate um, my point about. I guess your your um my my point about you have asked an, an important operational question. And, and and the point that I made with simple but not any simpler is avoid the two extremes. Right? Usually in research as in life, the extremes are never the right answer. So one extreme is what you have described. I would call it paralysis. So paral a paralyzing situation would be. There are 1.72 million factors in this world, right? And, and which one am I going to pick? 
because all of them seem to be relevant and one feels paralyzed. That's that's one one extreme. The other extreme is oversimplification of the numerous factors. You pick only one, right? And you imagine that it's a linear uh, relationship and that's oversimplification. And all I'm saying is for practical purposes, at least go beyond one. Right, at least go at least go beyond the oversimplification at one layer of nuance. And that nuance, in my experience, can actually go a really long way. Right. So corruption is one example. Instead of measuring it from zero to one hundred without any distinction between types, how about just make four types? Four types and then measure that. Right. And you might, and some people do complain. They're like, why four? Why not 14? Why not 27? Why not 829? Well, because that leads to paralysis, right? So it's always about a balance between paralysis and oversimplification, and I make a practical choice. I'm going to add a layer of nuance, and I think this is enough. It goes a long way. And also research is never by one person. It's actually a community. So I'll add one layer, and I hope that someone else will come in and contribute another factor, another layer, so we can add up to a, a richer understanding of whatever we are trying to study. So that's my approach, right? The extremes are never right. So do the practical thing of adding another layer where you think that layer is an essential component that cannot be ignored. Now, in the case of China, how did I pick my domains? Now, obviously, the economy is of clear importance. Everyone wants to understand how the Chinese economy took off right, and, and, and developed. The other domain that I focus a lot on is the bureaucracy. And the reason I focus on the bureaucracy is because in China, you do not have formal democratization, obviously. The political system did not formally change. It's still one party before, and then it's still one party now. But what fundamentally and, and, and continuously changed in China is governance, is how the bureaucracy worked, how it's incentivized, what its goals are, what it actually did. So that's why I picked the economy and bureaucracy. And some people can be critical. They'll be like, what about this? What about X? What about Y? What about Z? What about J? What about K? Please write those other books. I welcome that. Right, I welcome sequels. I welcome sequels, additions, a conversation. That's that's a research. It's actually a community. Right, it's not it's not my job to do everything. I'm not a supermarket. <laughs> and 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 the question about education, I think I would just kind of tie it back into. Um, we often, I think, in development economics, try to look for a silver bullet. Right, the one factor that would explain everything. So maybe it's institutions, or maybe it's history, or maybe it's eradication, eradicating corruption, and education is another one. Right? I mean, if, if only you had education, everything would be solved. I think we, we tend to have this mechanical mindset, the right button. It's a button mindset. Right? If only you find the right button. But the reality in development is... And I would and I and I and I would and I would, and I would uh, borrow this phrase: um, all happy families are happy in the same way, but unhappy families are unhappy in numerously different ways. <laughs> right. So what that really tells us is you need all the stars to line up to have development, and education is one of the star. Right. And that's how I would see it from a systems perspective: is to understand, yes, education matters, but it's not the silver bullet. It's not some button you can press. But what you need to do in your analysis is to be able to go further and identify which factors are relevant at which stage of development. Right. And so there may be a particular stage in which a in which for developing countries, primary education, and I'm here, I'm just speculating. Primary education could be more relevant than higher education. And subsequently, at mature stages, higher education becomes more important. That's just one example. But I think that's that's where we can really make a contribution, which is to identify at what stage are what factors relevant, right? But in order to really get to the other side, you need all the stars to line up. switched on yes yeah it was it was um 
what I'd imagined as well in in your work, which is quite narrative based, as as I understand it, at, at the beginning you're asking questions and wandering around and seeing what works, is in in some sense what are the salient dimensions or the salient relationships emerges through that more open ended discussion. So, you know, if you can go into a situation in a relatively theory free way, so you're saying what's salient rather than what's the relationship between this and this, then you become confirmed in the idea that these these are critical factors or, you know, these these, these are the processes at this stage, but not at that stage. So I, I, I like the phrase, I mean, Einstein said, you know, simple, but not too simple. But this idea that simplicity that comes on the other side of complexity means that if you ask enough questions in a broad enough, open ended enough way, then what are the hills and valleys? You know, what are the salient points and the salient relationships can emerge? And then the only thing you've got to then worry about is, is that that will help you understand how you've got to the present. But be, because of this kind of idea of, of, of the future is always emerging in, in many ways in unknown, unknown ways, then you've still always got to be saying, but is it changing? We've understood this now, but, but what's new? But I think I, I don't hear you or think that we should predefine dimensions or predefine relationships. We're really asking in a much more open-ended way what's salient. And it does mean sometimes that that it may be, you know, you're, you had a particular interest in political economy. It may be in other situations, there are other factors that are that are more important or as important. So but I'm kind I'm kind of agree. I'm kind of think I'm saying what I think you do. So it's uh, thank you. Two more questions. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for for the lecture. I I re I'm here. <laughs> uh, I really really enjoyed it, uh, and uh, we we read your papers in our reading group, so it was really beautiful to to see it uh, in, to see you in person. Um, uh, I wanted to ask. You said that. Uh, in development, there are sacrifices to be made. It's not uh, a pleasurable process in all aspects, uh, and uh, uh, and and but also while recognizing that development should also be about making people's life better, uh, improving their well-being, and and we don't want to reach a high income status and still have people working sixty hours a week uh, and uh, and face a massive pressure at school and at work. Uh, so, and at the same time, as you said, we don't want to impose the Denmark of the institutions on, on developing countries. Uh, but how can we include considerations on inequality and people's well-being, at least to some degree, along the way of development, and not simply at the end of the process, uh, or or for high-income countries? especially when we know that for some high income countries those considerations don't really come at the end of of the process of development thank you uh, there's another one um i don't know whether i should ask my question seated or standing but you're able to see me from up here so my, my question really is first of all let's start with the comments um I'm I'm really a proponent of uh, adaptive political economy because I think it's more realistic, it's more practical. In the past, like growing up, for instance, back in my country, they always say like you should borrow, you should go for maybe like a benchmarking study in Singapore to be able to become. I'm from Kenya, so to so that we can our economy can grow and become like the you know the Asian tigers. Now, China did their own thing. I'm not sure they did benchmarking in Singapore for you to, to thrive, you know, economy-wise. Basically, if you look at the, de um, the development studies, generally, we have different forms of political economy or feminist political economy across which is sort of adaptive to the feminist, you know, um, school of thought. So I am more of a proponent of adaptive because to me it's more realistic. The other, the other issue I want to, the other comment I want to make is about modernization. I think modernization to me is much more fluid, it's more contextual. And now to my question is concerning now that you have done some in-depth research concerning adaptive political economy, have you developed some sort of rubric or 
matrix of contextualizations that other countries can kind of use it. Probably it will be domesticated to, you know, prevailing circumstances in those countries. Do you, um, have you been able to work on that? I'm also cognizant of the fact that you mentioned you're not a supermarket, so I'm very cognizant of that. But probably you've been able to develop some sort of matrix of from your various researches, qualitative and quantitative, that you can be able to advise that probably would be useful and resourceful for developing countries like my own. Thank you. Hello? Nathan, still one here. Oh, yes. Hi, thanks a lot for a great, um, very stimulating presentation. Um, I'm just curious about your journey. Um, I take from your presentation, that, and I've and I followed your work before, that your latest paper on adaptive political economy, in a sense, is an outcome of, of this journey. Um, and then you made reference to, you know, the extensive set of interviews and life histories that you conducted back in, in, in China, you know, for your first book. Um, so my curiosity is really about when you, are, when you went to do this fieldwork, what were your models, your theoretical models of reference? Um, you obviously came from some background and you got there. And, and, and some of your concepts like directed improvisation were the outcome of your engagement with the, with the, with the data, with the, with the evidence and, you know, grounding these concepts from that evidence. But did you have some theoretical models when you got there and you ditched them or what were they? Well, three really excellent questions. I especially appreciate the last one. Let, let me get to that last. A first question about inclusive development. It's a really important question. My my, I would try to keep my response brief, but um, I I would I would go back to a point that I made in my presentation, which is we pay too little attention to innovation by the poor, and if you ask me. How do we create inclusive development? Focus on the innovation by the poor, right? Because the, the kind of activities and entrepreneurship that they created suits them. That's why they created it, right? And so Nollywood is an example where you have this industry that rose bottom up. And if you look at the amount of GDP produced, I think today it's around 5%, and some people go poo-poo, it's only 5%. But I think we need to drop that sort of GDP fixation and really think about, well, who's participating in that activity, right? How many benefits does it create for young people when they participate in it, right? It's an accessible industry, and not only by the producers, but also by the consumers, so I think we need to pay attention to the innovation among the poor. That's the answer to inclusive development. And even China is an example. The 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 I, I can't remember the exact number, but the fastest rate of poverty eradication in China actually came in around the first 10 years. And that's because in the first 10 years, China's reforms were focused on agricultural reforms. They were focused on the countryside. So the benefits were tremendously broad-based, even though the, the nominal contribution to GDP may, might have been very modest compared to the urban and industrial reforms that came later. Right? So I would say we need, to, we need to acknowledge that actually there's a lot of innovation by, by the poor, by non-elites, by people who are just trying to survive. But we kick that all out of development. And I wrote an anecdote in my paper, Adaptive Political Economy, where I presented this. I presented, um, I presented this and, and various other um, research I've done on innovation among the poor. And the response from this elite academic department was, that sounds too simple. That's their response. And I go to Africa and I repeated their response. And you should have seen how people respond to that. Right. And I think we need to do a lot of reflection. Right? As we as academic elites, I, I really think it's time for us to do a little bit of reflection. So you think that doing foreign aid is not too simple, but somehow innovation by the poor, that's poo poo too simple. Do we have double standards? Can we please do a little bit of reflection? That's all I'm saying. Right. So, so, so it's a great question. 
Um, the second question, comments and question, I think what you mean by matrix is, is like templates and role models. So what I hope to provide in all of my work is some kind of role model, some kind of template that you can study development in these alternative ways. You do not need to benchmark yourself against the first world. And so I just need to, I just hope to provide some examples so we can do that. And there are, um, and it's heartening when I see uh, researchers from other parts of the world, particularly from the global south, take what I've done and adapt it to their countries. And that's what I, that's what I hope to encourage. So for instance, the unbundled corruption index, which was a very simple exercise, actually, it was just adding another layer of nuance to the measurement of corruption. But I've had researchers from um, different parts of the world, from Vietnam to Poland to Hungary, reach out to me and say, I'd like to repeat that in my country, right? And, and so that's what I hope to, to encourage. Because I think for too long in classical development economics, we've only seen sort of one kind of role model, right? One kind of benchmark. Like you have to compare yourself to the first world and you have to think in these ways. So all I hope to do in my work is to just show people that, you know, you can try a different way, but I'm not saying that my way is the way. I'm just saying it's a way, right? And I hope that other people can also contribute Right, that there, there, there are different ways of of, of researching um, development with a focus that is not that is not based on mechanic false mechanical uh, assumptions. Then I really appreciate your last question. My God, that's an amazing question. Um, and 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 so so you had asked, what's the journey? What's the reference point? And um, you know, if you read the preface of my first book, which is like two pages. And I learned later that, that the two pages was like probably everyone's favorite in that book. You know, I should have just, just wrote a stop at the two pages. <laughs> um, and but basically what I wrote in the two pages is I had a very traditional classical education in political economy at Stanford, right? Douglas North was at Hoover Institution. You know, so it's a very, very traditional, world-class classical and which means that I, I went into China and I was supposed to apply the principal agent model. You know, this is like central government. It has these goals. It's going to control the local governments in this way. And then it's a story of incentives, right? So I, I find these incentives and you say, oh, because of these incentives, China succeeded. And that was initially actually kind of more or less the dissertation I wrote. And it was good enough to find me a job. So it was not such a bad dissertation, right? But when I was trying to write my dissertation to a first book, I, I couldn't do it because uh, people were asking me these hard questions for which I had no answers. People were like, but, you know, these incentives, do they change? Where do they come from? Right? And I especially have to thank Professor Arthur Colley at Princeton because he, he, he invited me to a workshop and he said, you know, Give me the historical answers. Where do these incentives come from? How do they change over time? And I was like, oh, gee, that's th those are really pesky questions, you know? And, and I found that I can't write this first book because I'll be fooling myself. I found my story artificial and static because that's how I've been taught to think, right? And I'm like, so I think I, so what I did my first book was I'm gonna like unlearn. Right? I'm going to take what's already programmed into my head and I'm going to delete that app. And I'm going to install a new app. So I had to create one app for myself. <laughs> and so the first book was incredibly difficult to write because it wasn't just a kind of like, usually we do some sort of copy and paste, right? We just kind of fill in the blanks and we kind of more or less know what we're talking about. But I really had to reinvent a paradigm for myself. We're like, wow, this is a this is clearly a story with so many moving parts. And in my classical training, we have no tools for dealing with this kind of complexity. So that's how I wrote my first book. And then after I wrote my first book, um, the first few years, the response was absolutely dismal. Dismal, right? So I'm very lucky today that gradually more people read it. At first, it was absolutely dismal. One of my few supporters was Hajun. He wrote a he wrote a great comment on the back, but everyone else was like, "Are you out of your mind? You know, or you know, who do you think you are? Right? Who? Why do I want your 
You know, I don't want your app, right? We already have apps, right? Nobody wants a new one from you. So it was absolutely dismal. I was scorned. I was laughed at. I was, you know, just shooed out of presentations. And I absolutely hated my book for some time, to be honest. You know, I really hated that thing. But it was, it really took me some years, talk speaking of a journey, to understand, ah, oh, that's what the journey is about. So the adaptive political economy article, you, you called it an outcome, and I thought it was a very interesting word. I'm not sure if it's an outcome or if it was actually there in the first place. It's just that I, I didn't have enough knowledge to articulate it. But I think I had an instinct. I sort of I had a I had kind of a I saw the like a ghost outline. But I, but I couldn't quite see the flesh and bone yet. Right? And I had to go into the deep details of a single case and then other cases and try out other things. And then I think 10 years later, now is actually 10 years later, I'm like, I think I can see it in clearer, clearer light because of the journey. But I'm actually not sure if it's an outcome. I, I, think, I think it might actually have been the start. So thank you, that's a beautiful question. Um, thanks very much. Ha Jun has time for some brief concluding comments before we go out to the reception just outside. Thank you, Yuan, uh, for an amazing lecture. And thank you, Da Jean and Da Jonathan, for very, very the perspicuous uh, remarks. Uh, I think uh, we've seen the best example of how social science uh, research uh, should be done here. I mean, first of all, true interdisciplinarity, uh, not the cocktail party interdisciplinarity practiced uh, so much by mainstream economists uh, these days. Yeah? You go to a party, talk to a historian, hear about one interesting historical episode, and then you have a paper. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, whole research is uh, based on truly the, 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 the kind of uh, profound empirical work, you know, I mean, the, talking to local bureaucrats in the, the, the provincial China, you know, amassing this and then, you know, distilling and uh, processing and, you know, the, creating a the real historical narrative and, you know, taking everything, yeah? rather than just uh, picking convenient you know, the facts, yeah? I mean, the, the, the why nations fail, I mean, the, I mean the, they're not the only ones, but the, 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 it's a classic example, you know. It it keeps talking about the British institutions being inclusive, yeah? Mm -hmm. And, you know, even one casual fact I will completely the, the throw this off. You know, the, during the Boer War, the difference in average height of the officers uh, from the upper class and the soldiers uh, from the working class was five inches. Yeah? You call that society the inclusive? Yeah? But, you know, I mean, the, the, <laughs> it's that, 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 that uh, allowed to ignore those things that, that, you know, when you have a great theory. Yeah? So, so that I, I think that, that, that Yuan's uh, work, was, uh, the work is uh, that, that truly brilliant. But uh, finally, I mean, that, that, that her willingness and that, that actually plea to others uh, to, to acknowledge and celebrate all these different perspectives, yeah? Not just Western elite perspective, but perspective from different classes, different people, different nations, you know, the different uh, the kind of uh, regions uh, the, the, and, and different, if you like, uh, ideological the, the, the points of view. So thank you. I mean, you've uh, given us a brilliant uh, example of uh, the how to do uh, social science research, uh, the, you know, DLD tries to bring different perspectives and the different people together to think about the development, the, the challenges and opportunities. So that your lecture was uh, perfect as uh, the first uh, 
of our annual lectures. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming uh, to listen to the, the, this uh, wonderful lecture. And yeah, let's uh, go out uh, and have a drink, yeah?